We have two guests today. On the left is uh, Mike Pettin, 1999 Pennsylvania High School Coach of the Year and one, in the, one of the winningest coaches in state history. And on the right is District 1 Coach of 1999, his son, Mike Pettin, Jr., uh, Mike Sr., let's start with you. Your involvement in football dates back to the seventh grade. How do you feel about football in those days? All sports, and it was just something, uh, you know, everybody in the neighborhood did, and once organized uh, football was an opportunity uh, in seventh grade. I started out as a little runt, 100-pound team, and uh, have either played or coached every year uh, except for this upcoming season. So I'll have an interesting adjustment the first fall since I can remember uh, without football. You said you were a hundred pound run? Well, you know, in seventh grade, you know, that's back in those days, you had a uh, hundred pound team, you gravitated up to the junior high. And then of course, in 10th grade, uh, you played varsity, regardless of what you weighed. It was a very small school. Actually, it was seven through 12, Conshohocken and high. My graduating class, we had a total of 55 people. There were 22 guys on our football team. The first day, uh, one guy got hurt. We didn't even have enough to have a full scrimmage. Did you have any idea back in those days that you would eventually devote a lot of time to the sport? Uh, I like coaching. Uh, the idea that, uh, you know, after college, that's something I, I knew I always wanted to uh, pursue. Uh, I wanted to be a teacher. I had some teachers in high school that really helped me. So I thought, uh, you know, the best way to coach is to teach. And I thought, you know, teaching would be, you know, a great career. So uh, as I look back, you know, if I had to do it over again, I do exactly the same thing. Uh, I just love my uh, chosen profession. And I'm glad I had the balance of a classroom teacher, uh, you know, with the coaching because you, you get to see the big picture. You know, sometimes, uh, you know, myself, uh, personalities, football coaches can get very one dimensional. And I always had that balance in the classroom as kids would remind me, hey, there are more important things. And of course, when, when you're teaching world cultures and history and economics, uh, you begin to see there's a lot more to life than football. Although, uh, if you talk to my wife, that's all there was, you know, football. So even back in those days, you were given, you were giving consideration to balancing your life between the game and, and your family. Well, the, the balance was just struck because of the nature, you know, a good classroom teacher, you're not going to maintain your job. And uh, my, my wife did a great job. I was there as much as I could. But as, as a young uh, teacher and coach, uh, and I, I coached several sports, uh, we went right through football season and basketball coaching. You went through Christmas uh, vacation when, when most of the, you know, the teachers were home with their kids. So my wife, Joyce, has done a great job. And, uh, you know, three kids I had turned out pretty good. But now the, the quality time, I, I think I miss with my three kids. I'm, I'm making sure I have with my grandchildren. Uh, Mike Patton Jr., let, let's talk to you now. Uh, what were the circumstances that led you into getting involved in the sport of football? I never really gave much thought to, to getting into coaching um, until after I had, I had finished uh, playing in college. Uh, you know, now, growing up, I mean, I thought everybody played football. I mean, it was just a, a way of life for me. I started out with the, you know, in the, in the little leagues and started out the 65-pound program and then uh, ended up, you know, playing right through uh, middle school and into high school, played four years of college. But when I, when I got out of college, I, I think I kind of went through withdrawal symptoms. I mean, I hear I'd been involved with, with organized football for 15, 16 years and uh, really didn't know what to do with myself. And, and um so that's when I, I just started to help him out part time at, at Central Bucks West, and uh, I was instantly hooked. I mean, I, I could not uh, spend enough time there, and then became a full time assistant, and, uh, and and have been involved with with coaching ever since. Now, that's why it uh, it's going to be interesting uh, for me to see the effect that it's going to have on him. I mean, it, after 15 years of playing, uh, I mean, I could not wait to to somehow get get back involved with the sport, and and I, I know he's going to suffer a good bit this fall, you know, just trying to trying to shut that off. But I know he's always going to be involved in the game somehow. But uh, mm -hmm. I know this is going to be a tough fall for him. Retirement after 33 years, coach? 33 years as a head coach, 38 altogether in coaching and teaching. Well, actually teaching, I retired in 96. So I continued coaching after I, I officially retired from the classroom. Uh, Mike Jr., let's go back to uh, uh, your story. Let, let's, let's take it up from when you graduated college. 
you said you weren't sure what you were going to do with your life at that point? Yeah, at that point, I had gotten a, uh, a BA in economics from the University of Virginia uh, and began work at a, at a large insurance company and, and uh, just felt that, that something was missing. Uh, you know, and unfortunately, I, I wasn't smart. Uh, and if, I, if I had to do it all over again, I would have gotten my, gotten my teaching certificate at, at Virginia as opposed to, to, the, to, the, uh, to the BA. Um, but it's just something that, uh, and that's the way it worked out. I, I should have realized that maybe I you know, should have maybe caught a glimpse of one of his pay stubs or something like that and realized that uh, teaching was, would, would have been a good way to go. Um, you know, given what the salaries have become, especially in this area. Um, but I really did not think about coaching at all until right after I finished. And when you uh, graduated college and you started helping out your dad at that point as an assistant? It was really part-time. I'd go scout for him. Uh, and then on game night, I would help him out uh, up in the press box, just kind of as a spotter, helping with you know, whatever I could see up there. I really wasn't involved with the day-to-day -day practice operations that first year, uh, but then the following year I had adjusted my schedule so I was able to get off work early enough that I, that I became a full-time assistant. Now when you were out there scouting, what were you looking for? What's the first thing you look for in a promising player? Uh, well, it wasn't so much scouting players, it was just opponent scouting. So usually it involves you know, taking a video camera and uh, you know, trying to pick up some things, you know, the standard things when you go to scout, uh, you know, any, any tendencies, you know, kind of just make mental notes as you go. You kind of try to pick up the other team's cadence and just any other general observations you can make over the course of the game while you're taping it. Um, you know, anything that can be beneficial for you the following week. Mike Sr., what was your reaction when your son wanted to come back into the area of football? Well, I was very pleased. Uh, you know, he knows the game. He knows the West tradition. He knows what it takes. Um, you know, he's, he's pretty bright. I always say he's fortunate. He got his mother's IQ and not mine. Uh, so he was a welcome addition uh, to the staff and always very innovative. And, uh, you know, if you watch his teams play, uh, they adapt very well. And they do a lot of uh, crazy stuff that uh, I couldn't think of. So, <laughs> And I'm proud of his accomplishments. You know, it's it's a tough situation to, uh, you know, I know he gets compared to, to me a lot, but, you know, he's uh, carved out his own niche at William Tenn and High and brought their program around. And now at North Penn, the coaches in this area would always refer to North Penn as the sleeping giant. And since he's taken over the program with his fine uh, assistant coaches, uh, they're more than competitive. Did you have hopes back then when your son joined you? or before he joined you rather, that he would somehow follow in your footsteps? Did you ever uh, maybe no. even try to impress that on him at some point? I don't think we ever talked about, hey, you should become a coach. You know, it's, it's a great career and a lot of rewards. It's just something, you know, he had to get a taste of. And, uh, you know, what he described, uh, people going into the business world, uh, some of my former players that have gone that route and, uh, you know, they missed the game and, they missed the rewards of working with, with young people. Uh, one of my former players, uh, Timmy Donovan, was very successful in the corporate world and decided after a couple of years to go back to Villanova, get his education degree, get a, become a graduate assistant there, learned football, and then became a high school coach and has done a, a great job. He's now a principal, but he's just one of four or five that have uh, taken a look at what they missed and decided, I want to get back in coaching in one way or another. Do you frequently hear from ex-players? Yes. Um, and of course, uh, since I retired, uh, a lot of congratulations. And it's especially gratifying to get the letters from players that uh, maybe you didn't think got that much out of the program. They weren't superstars. They didn't play in college. But, uh, you know, jot you a, a note saying that, uh, you know, their experience made a difference in their life. Uh, whether it be, you know, in business or, or with her family, uh, you know, the discipline, the time management, uh, you know, the, the values, you know, the feedback that any teacher likes to hear. Uh, you know, he mentioned my pay stubs. Uh, certainly uh, teaching is not a bad occupation financially, but you'll never get rich. But there are rewards in teaching and coaching that you, you just can't get, uh, you know, getting the big bucks. And, uh, you know, that's why a lot of people give up uh, a great deal in the business world to, to get in, into education. Did you hear from any ex-players that 
uh, you didn't expect to hear from and, and you found what they had to say uh, especially pleasing or rewarding? Yes, you know, I keep a, a file. I have a good letter file and a bad letter file. <laughs> I've said, you know, the last couple of years, uh, you know, the, the good letter file is getting a little bit thicker. But, uh, you know, the championships, uh, everything, the, the trophies, uh, those mean more to me. When you look back and, you know, how is your life rewarding? And, and to get that kind of feedback, mm -hmm. uh, you just can't put a price tag on it. And you really feel that you, you've had some impact and value. And as I mentioned, the high school teachers helped me and my coaches. You know, it's a cycle. You just want to give back because I know I know how instrumental they were in helping me out and shaping uh, that I stay on a straight and narrow. And my one coach uh, with a phone call helped me get a scholarship into college when I thought I was going to be shut out. You know, people say, well, you do a pretty good job getting your kids in school. And I'm, I'm only giving back the help that was given me. So, you know, and I think, uh, you know, that's what life is all about. You know, you're helped along the way and then you try to give back. Do you care to talk about any of the letters that are in that hopefully thin, bad file? Well, I can just say, you know, generally, uh, oh, the bad file. The bad file, well, you know, sometimes the parent will have a uh, youngster not play and it's, it's pretty tough to accept that maybe they didn't have the talent. Would that be the bulk of the bad file? Uh, disgruntled pretty parents? Much, pretty much so. Disgruntled parents or, or fans that, uh, you know, and rarely are they signed. And I realize this because I'm a parent. When I looked at when he played, it was tough for me to be objective. So that helped me dealing with parents when they were criticizing their kids playing time or our approach. You know, I, I realized where they're coming from because uh, I, I was through it somewhat with, with him. You know, it's really difficult uh, to be objective. And the parents I appreciate most are the ones whose kids don't play, but come to me after the three-year experience and say, Coach, my kid got a lot out of your program. And I'm talking about kids sometimes that uh, never started a game. Now, you know that really means something uh, because I've always said, you know, football is a great game. You should have a no-cut policy that just the experience of going through the discipline and, and the, the teamwork and the camaraderie and, uh, you know, getting to deal with losses and hopefully more wins than losses, uh, these are lessons you're going to take uh, throughout life. Uh, some people just measure their experience on, okay, how much did my kid play? You know, how big is his scrapbook? Uh, did you get him into college? And that's a great side effect, but I always tell the parents, you know, that's not the main reason your kid should be in sports. If that develops, that's great, but that shouldn't be your primary goal. Well, let's bring our viewers up to date then. Mike Sr., you retired after the 99 season. You retired uh, uh, from teaching in 1996. Now, Mike Jr., you're still in the middle of a uh, successful career. Uh, can you tell us? When you competed against each other for the first time, what kind of emotions were running through your mind at that time? Well, uh, personally, it was I, I, I tried to just sh shut out you know all the, the the hoopla that was going on surrounding it. There was so much media hype for that uh, for that first meeting, uh, and, and it was difficult. But you know the way that I learned from him and and uh, how to prepare for things and and some great advice that he gave me along the way was was never worry about things that you have no control over. So, uh, you know, the things that I had control over was, was trying to prepare our team to play them. Um, so it was, it was a tough week for us, and obviously we came out on, on the short end of it. Um, you know, but it was an experience that, you know, that we learned from and, and, uh, and, and moved on from it. But it's when I look back and, and saw the, you know, the, the hype in the articles and the, and the television stations that were there, it was, it was neat to look back on. Um, because it, uh, I think somebody had indicated that I think it might have been the first time ever in Pennsylvania that a, that a father had, had coached against uh, his son, both as head coaches. Hmm. Um, so to look back on it, it's nice. Um, but uh, you know, it wasn't that much fun not, uh, not winning the game. And, and uh, unfortunately now I came up on the short end five times against them, you know, four times in the last two years. And, and um, you know, I guess... Hopefully he felt uh, he felt us closing the gap a little bit, so uh, that's why he decided I chased him out of coaching. That's what I felt. <laughs> so, Mike Senior, what was on your mind before that first game against your uh, son with these rival schools well, competing? Well, I, I dreaded the whole scene. You know, when he was at William Tennant uh, School in the league, but they didn't play us. 
and he was doing well. I, I was kidding him one time. I said, don't win too many. They're going to move you up to our division. You'll have to play with the big boys, and you're going to get spanked. Jokingly. Well, of course, that was his pregame talk to his players. Uh, but uh, I, I was in a no-win situation. You know, all parents like to see their kids do well. Uh, I want to see him win every game, win championships. But uh, wait a minute now. You, you got to walk over your old man for this. And, you know, the kids I coach and love. So, uh, as I said, it, it was no win. Uh, now, it wasn't so much for the rest of the family. You know, they thought it was neat. I think it was tough on his mom. Most of the family members were, were taking up for junior and, uh, you know, they made no bones about it. They, hey, Dad, you've had enough success. So uh, it, it, w it was interesting. But uh, relief more than anything else for me uh, when the game was over. Uh, liked the win, but I was happy for my kids. You know, I, at one point, I remember the first game, and his team wasn't doing well, and I looked across the field, and I think the score was 30-some uh, to zero in the second quarter, and I could just – empathize having been on those rough nights and to see that uh, dejection hey it's my son over there and and I really couldn't enjoy that uh, our team was doing that well so uh, I don't know it was that much uh, that I was afraid was closing the gap or uh, you know five games in the media circus but in all fairness I think uh, the more uh, the media got used to it uh, uh, both of us told papers and, and TV, hey, just concentrate on the kids. The game's for them. But, of course, you can imagine that first one, the, the way it was played up. Uh, it was everything uh, I, I dreaded more as far as uh, the interviews and the focus on us when you would hope the focus would be on the two schools and the kids playing the game. But, you know, I, I know it's in a human interest story, and a, a lot of people tuned in because it was father versus son. What were some of the headlines? Do you remember? Well, before the game, the sun also rises. Uh, you know, after the game, father knows best. Uh, and all the cliches. Uh, I don't know if you remember. I don't think I read the paper afterwards. So <laughs> Did I you consciously know. avoid the paper, maybe? No, I mean, I, I'm just kidding. I mean, I, I looked at it, but, uh, you know, it wasn't anything I was going to, you know, cut out and put in a scrapbook. Now, Mike Sr., when you looked across the uh, field on that one occasion and empathized with your son, did you do that on more than one occasion, and was that a serious distraction that you finally, you caught yourself and you had to correct yourself and get back on track and concentrate on your boys and your game? Yeah, one time my assistant coach grabbed me and he saw that, uh, you know, I wasn't handling it too well, and he kind of shook my arm and he said, uh, hey, you know, we'll have his turn. Uh, more or less snapped me out of it. And, but then the other games were, were so close, you know, I, I didn't have time to feel bad because, you know, he had us on the run. But I, I kind of got a little used to it, but as I said, it was never that much fun for me. Uh, you know, and even now, you know, people say, well, what are you going to do? You got CB West and you got North Penn. And you know, I still have those same emotions. Mm -hmm. I mean, Mike Carey, the new head coach, I look at him like a brother. I know all those kids and I got my son, you know, coaching in North Penn. So it's, it's, it's but as I mentioned to you before, I, I still bleed black and gold here. Now, Mike Jr., let's put your situation in context. You're, of course, uh, the coach of the team, and you don't have your teaching certificate, so you're not a teacher here. Do you have some function here at the school besides coaching? Yeah, my, my title is uh, audiovisual technology specialist, so I'm in charge of all the AV equipment, not only here in the building, but uh, district-wide. I have uh, responsibilities in, not only in the high school, but it's 13 elementary schools and three middle schools in the high school. Uh, and then from the technology end of it, um, you know, a lot of the standalone computers, uh, I, I, I do a lot of work with those. Not, we have a lot of network things that's handled by a different, uh, different group out of our administrative office. But uh, certainly I have enough responsibilities that uh, keeps me busy. Did you have an idea you'd end up in that field after school? Uh, it was ironic. I, I was a graduate assistant out at the University of Pittsburgh uh, in 93 and 94. Uh, and as my tenure as a GA was, was expiring, you're allowed to be one for two years, um, there was a, looked like there was going to be an opportunity for me to get a full-time coaching job there, but it wasn't going to open maybe for a little while. So I decided to, to kind of stay close to the program, and I took the video coordinator's job uh, for a season, uh, not thinking that, that that experience would ever help me in any way, shape, or form uh, down the road. Uh, and, and when the job opportunity fell through, uh, I, 
I knew that there was a head coach opening at William Tennant High School in Warminster, and ironically, they had an uh, opening for their media specialist. So mm -hmm. it was just a natural fit there. Uh, and then after two seasons there, there was an opening here for, for essentially the same position. So uh, that, that brief experience as the, as the video coordinator uh, at Pittsburgh, which I never thought would help me, turned out uh, being a blessing. I'll put this question out to whoever cares to answer it first. Was there a time when your teams competed that, given your relationship, father and son, when you were trying to guess what the other guy was doing, you knew? Uh, having grown up in the program and played in the program and coached in the program, uh, it, it, it was a little, I think, a little bit easier on my end, um, just having that familiarity. Uh, and, and kind of knowing what they were going to do, but it, but at West, it's most of the time it's uh, there are people in the stands. I mean, they can sit and, and call the plays, but West is so disciplined and so excellent technique-wise. Uh, it's a matter of not. Sometimes you know what they're doing, but it's a, it's another matter to stop it. Um, and then when you have uh, fullbacks like a Dave Armstrong or Dustin Pachotti, and, and uh, you know coaches come up with all these X's and O schemes against them, uh, but I always say when when their X can run over your O. Uh, you know, it's, you're going to be in some trouble. So it was sometimes frustrating when you knew what was coming uh, and, and you weren't able to stop it. Well, we do a pretty good job, I think, of computer scouting. And uh, Mike Carey, the defense coordinator, is, uh, is excellent. And, I, you know, I'm not saying we could call their plays, but I thought we had a pretty good handle on them. And, uh, you know, a lot of what they were running was, uh, you know, very familiar. It was like, the CB West offense to a point, but to his credit, uh, as I said, he's very innovative. Uh, William Tennant, he had a shotgun. He ran the, the run and shoot wide open, uh, you know, something uh, I would never even think of. And now when he came to North Penn, he adapted. He has uh, bigger, stronger kids. He's, he's going into a power football. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think, uh, the main ingredient we had and, and, uh, you know, he mentioned we were successful, uh, five times is uh, I like to think our tradition is a little deeper, you know, our, our weight room uh, discipline, uh, the way our kids work. Uh, we've been entrenched a little longer and I, I know he's uh, closed the gap, but uh, you know, we like to think that uh, we're still king of the hill. Now a lot, a lot of people want to change that and he became pretty close to doing it. But it, it, it made for a, a pretty interesting football game. And, and, and the hitting, uh, the hitting was ferocious. You know, if you just like basic football, it wasn't so much you were looking at strategy. It was just the, the you know, the competition, uh, the emotion. I think that's when most people went away and, you know, said, hey, both, both teams play a spirited game. One of your assistant coaches uh, said of you, uh, Mike Sr., it was Mike Carey that said, he hates to lose in anything. Is that true? Just take that at face value? Yeah, and he was even quoted as to say, whole oh, cheap, but what is he referring to? And I says, Mike, you know what people are going to think? I used to play Mike and pick up basketball, and he claimed I would call fouls when there weren't really any fouls. You know, so that's his idea. But, uh, yeah, I'm very competitive, and, you know, Mike should talk. He's the most competitive guy I've ever met. He's, again, the, the new head coach at uh, Central Bucks West. But uh, that's part of why I guess I got into coaching. You know, uh, when your career is over as a player, you know, you can still have those uh, feelings of competition. And of course, it's not like being actually on the field, but, you know, the st strategy and the excitement that uh, you can feel it to, a, you know, a certain point. So I always felt, you know, being involved with football, staying with it, coaching, being around the kids, uh, you know, just help keep you young. So that's going to be maybe adjustment I have when, when I'm away from it. I'm not out there in the field. Uh, you know, I don't get the adrenaline flow like in the Big 33 game. I'm saying, gee, do I really want this again with a knot in your stomach? You can't sleep. And, you know, the pregame tension, uh, you almost get addicted to that, that thing. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's we'll see how I adjust. Will I have to go into a decompression uh, after doing it for so many years? So, as you said, you may have been addicted to that kind of tension. Uh, at the same time, are you feeling any kind of relief right now, even though the season hasn't started up yet at the time of this taping? 
summer 2000. Well, relief, uh, I coached the Big 33 game, and, and the Pennsylvania faithful made it very clear that they could not handle losing to Ohio three times in a row. You know, I, I took the game, and uh, I knew there would be, you know, a lot riding on the game. Uh, but it's supposed to be a friendly all-star game. But as we got closer to the game, I kind of felt it's a lot more than a friendly all-star game. There, there was an urgency for Pennsylvania to come out on top. So, you know, the coaches will put pressure on themselves, and then you also feed off of the other pressure, the stimuli coming in. And, and you know, fortunately, I've been used to it with Central Bucks West. You know, preseason rankings, the high expectations, and you do get accustomed to it. And I think our kids have an advantage in big games because they've been through it before. Uh, and, you know, I think it helped me in, in, you know, coaching the Pennsylvania team and, and going out there realizing, hey, Pennsylvania has to do it this year. There's still the pressure, but it, it's a lot easier when you, you've experienced it and you've been through it. You know, and you hear this on any level, you know, teams that have that, that big game, that playoff uh, level competition, that experience. Uh, it serves them well when they can utilize that uh, down the road. And, of course, our team has been fortunate to have been, you know, those kids are in playoffs for three years if they're in our program. Mm -hmm. Hopefully it will continue that way. After observing the same age group up close for about 33 years, did you see the kids stay the same throughout that span, or did they change in any way? Well, you know, there are a lot of knocks put on, on kids today, but actually coaches today in all sports, if you look at basketball, soccer, and even the girls, uh, they're more demanding, uh, more time commitment. So you really can't say the kids uh, aren't as dedicated and, com and committed because uh, they have to be much more so than in the 50s and 60s and 70s, what, what coaches are asking. Now, the problem is at the same time, um, there are a lot more distractions. Uh, also, uh, I think... Uh, Give me an example to, of a distraction. Well, you know, uh, you have uh, the automobile. Uh, you know, just about all kids now, they, they, want, they want to drive when they're 16. Uh, you have the opportunity to get a job and, uh, you know, their friends are working. Uh, I want to work. Well, hey, football's in the way or, or going after the basketball team. Uh, I think like when I grew up and when I was coaching in my early years, uh, you know, having a job, getting your car at 16 wasn't such a big deal. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's that type of, of, of uh, pressure in it. You know, when I played too, hey, the, the, the high school kid who walked through the hallway with his, uh, you know, letter sweater or jacket, uh, you know, this was something that was looked up to. And, you know, today maybe there's a lot of animosity. It's, it's uh, you know, you, you got the clicks and maybe the, you know, the jocks are kind of, look down on. So it, it's not that much of a prestigious thing. That's not the reason why you, you want to do it. Uh, but nevertheless, that the status has changed? Is that what I, you're saying? Well, and, and, you know, maybe for the better. Uh, the big thing is, you know, talk about old-fashioned discipline, where I think uh, in the older days, my younger days, I think a lot of times uh, I was on the same page with the parents, with a lot of, you know, the, the, the strictness but, but I think things have changed in, in that regard. You know, one parent families, uh, I, I don't think the discipline is there like it used to. It, it's, it's difficult when I discipline somebody that this is the first time maybe they're facing this and they don't handle it well. Or you'll have a parent say, uh, and I, I didn't get much of this in my younger days of coaching, you know, I have a tough time with them. Hopefully you can handle them, see what you can do with them. Uh, you know, hey, in the 50s and 60s, uh, you know, these kids were taken out uh, behind the woodshed uh, when they didn't behave. And now if you do that, uh, you know, the kid will call the cop on you and, you know, you might get arrested for child abuse. So uh, there, there's definitely a different approach. And, and that's what I like about sports. It's uh, maybe one of the last areas in a kid's experience in high school that he can get some of that much needed discipline that he's going to need sometime in his life. Mike Jr., what kind of uh, discipline do you dish out to your players when and if it's necessary? Well, we're, we're pretty tough on our kids, and that's something that, uh, that I, I drew from uh, growing up in his program, and, and I'd like to think that we run a tight ship here, and, and, and I think you need to. I think it's, uh, it is a, an area where kids 
you know, it might be the only area in their life where they're getting some discipline. But I think that's the great thing about organized sports. I mean, we have a very strict attendance policy in our weight room. Uh, you know, we want our kids to consider it a privilege to be able to lift, um, whereas some programs, they, they have a hard time getting their kids to come in and work out. Uh, you know, we basically look at it as, you know, that if, you know, if they're not in their lift and their, their kids they're competing with are, um, you know, and we're, we're, very, we're very strict with that. Um, you know, du during the season, you know, we, it's a lot of the standard punishments. You know, kids have to run laps for certain things. And, and uh, you know, we, we teach, um, you know, we, we teach that football is a game of a million little things that, that add up to make you successful. I mean, there is no one magic switch where you can flip and you're suddenly going to be good. It's, it's a million little things. And, and when our guys aren't doing the little things right, then uh, they're going to hear about it. Now, what is the most uh, common infraction of the rules, if you will, where you have to uh, intercede and put your foot down? I just think overall it's, it would just be a, a lack of effort, what we would call a loaf during a certain play. Uh, to me, if, if you have teams that give great effort, you're, you're most likely going to be successful. Uh, and that's something you really you have to coach it every day, though. You can't you know, one day let, let them get by with it, then the next day um, – you'll be all over them about it. You have to be very consistent with it. Uh, and, and like I said, I mean, you have, you have to coach effort every day. How long have you been coaching so far? Uh, total, uh, it, it's 12 years. Uh, this will be my, I was a head coach at William Tenner for two years. Um, and then this will be my fourth season at, uh, at North Penn as the head coach. Do you suppose you relate to kids the same way your dad does? Um, to an extent, but since I'm younger, um, you know, obviously closer in age to the kids. Uh, I, pr I probably, especially during the off season, um, have a little bit more of a looser relationship with the kids than, than maybe he does. Uh, but I certainly try to maintain that professional distance, especially when the season starts. The kids, uh, the kids certainly see that and understand that. Now, besides uh, you two gentlemen competing against each other, uh, Mike Jr., can you tell me when you had your most uh, gut-wrenching moment out on the field? Uh, coaching against him? Mm -hmm. Not necessarily coaching against him. Any, I'm, I'm saying we can possibly exclude that and talk about any other situation too. Well, the, the one that, uh, that comes to mind instantly against him was, um, we were playing them in, uh, in 98 and it was just a, it was a monsoon and the game was played here. And, um, it was just a, the game was just a slugfest. I mean, it was a real basic football where, we I mean, you couldn't get too fancy because of the weather conditions and, and uh, they were up 13-12 late in the game, and, and uh, they mishandled a punt snap, and, and we took over and, and had a chance to kick a field goal, and the ball was so wet it went through our holder's hands. And um, just that helpless feeling of seeing the ball on the ground and them taking over and then us trying to stop them and them just pounding the fullback for, you know, eight or ten straight plays as, as the clock ran out. This, uh, you just feel like you're dying slow death. That, that was a, you know, very frustrating moment knowing that, that we, were, we were that close. Um, and then a situation I had at, at William Tennant, uh, we were up um, a point late in the game and, and the opponent was kicking a field goal and, uh, with, with five seconds left and, and, um, and they missed it, uh, but we roughed the kicker uh, and, and they were able, and the, and the roughing had no effect on the kick. I mean, the ball was definitely away and missed at that point. Uh, and they got to you know, move it closer and, and kicked it again and, and made it. So we went from the the joy of victory in a, in a heartbeat to the, to the agony of defeat. I mean, that, that, that probably really sticks in my mind as, as the, uh, the toughest moment as a coach. Would you like to have a tenure that uh, rivals your dad's of 33 years? Uh, I, I really can't. I'm just going to have to take it season by season. I can't sit. I, you know, I think I would go crazy if I, I sat here and tried to say I'm, I'm going to try to match him season for season and and win for win. Uh, and as he mentioned, the, the comparisons have already started. Uh, and that's frustrating. That's to me is the downside of, of getting into the, the same profession. I mean, I tell people I was a real, real idiot for, for becoming a high school coach, knowing I'm following in the footsteps of a, you know, of a guy who's an absolute legend, um, you know, with it. And with yet the, that didn't deter you. That, that took some courage. It, it, it didn't. Um, but part of it was, I was just so excited about the game. And, and the reason I was, was, you know, the advantage was, um, from being around him, you know, all that I had learned and, and the love that I ha had developed for the game. Uh, and, and you got to take the good with the bad. I mean, uh, you know, the good is I love the sport and, and I have an opportunity to be a part of it. And, and the bad was uh, there's going to be those natural comparisons. 
Now, a reporter did tell me I did reach 40 wins faster than he did, but uh, mm -hmm. I, d I doubt sincerely, especially now with, with the advent of playoffs and how competitive uh, high school sports have become, and especially around the state, uh, you know, the, the good programs in, in every region of the state, uh, you know, I doubt sincerely that, that anybody in, in that period of time uh, could come close to duplicating the, the success that he's had at Central Bucks West. After 33 games, uh, or 33 years rather, Mike Sr., why was it time to retire? Well, you know, when you coach, there are a lot of trade-offs. You're giving up a lot. You know, there was time away from the family, uh, vacation time. Not only do you personally make sacrifices, but your family has to make sacrifices. And you, you prioritize some things. And, uh, you know, when he played at Virginia, you know, one of the things I admire about some coaches and their, their kids get to high school, I'm going to stop coaching and watch my uh, son or daughter play or youngsters going off to college. I'm, I'm going to take, uh, you know, a leave of absence and, and watch him play. I, I didn't do that. And, and, and I regretted that when I look back, you know, when he played down at Duke and North Carolina and Clemson, uh, never made the games. It was always a big rush to go down to see him in Charlottesville, even in home games. Uh, and it just got to a point where I thought it'd say it's time to prioritize some other things. Uh, also, I think, uh, you know, pressure I mentioned before, it, you know, it gradually wears on you. Uh, you know, sometimes you have a tendency, even though I, I felt I, I mentioned I had balance as a teacher, uh, you know, always thinking football uh, at the dinner table. And you're watching TV, you know, uh, sometimes uh, my wife would ask me a question where there's no response because your mind was on my football. mind was on football. Uh, just, you know, focus, focus, focus. It's, uh, you know, how long do you keep up that pace? You know, God bless Joe Paterno. <laughs> 35 years now, right? I don't know, but he's 70 some years old. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, people have said, well, you know, you're not that old, you know, you're, you're 60, but, uh, you know, like the high school playoff, uh, 15 games the last couple of years. Well, I guess the last three years, it's been 15 games a year. It's like a season and a half. So I, I think there's a mental wear and tear and a physical wear and tear. And, you know, there was a time not that long ago, you would, you would ask me, are you going to give up the game when? I, I say, well, gee, I can't think of a time I'm going to give up the game. But then that, that changed the last, you know, four or five years. I began thinking about it. I'd say even last season, some, some nice days uh, when I could have been out golfing and practice wasn't going too well. And I'm thinking, gee, I, I could be enjoying a good game of golf. But, uh, when did you know 99 would be your last season? Uh, pretty much going into it. The one thing I wanted to be com comfortable with is something you take a long time to build up. Uh, you don't want to see it just crumble. I wanted it to be left in good hands. Uh, I was concerned because I, I didn't think Coach Carey would be interested. As it turned out, he had a change of heart, and he decided to take over, and uh, that made me retire uh, much more relaxed knowing that the program that we both built and, and the other coaches, but uh, Mike in particular uh, was with me the last 23 years. He played for me as a player before he went on to go to Pitt, mm. play for Johnny Majors. So uh, I'm optimistic that you're going to see the, you know, commitment to excellence continue. It was important to you there'd be a good successor in your place. Yes. And, you know, and as I say, you spend your life, uh, you know, partially building a tradition and, and you want to see it, uh, you know, continue. Was there one specific incident that made you say, this is going to be my last season for sure? Or was I, it kind of, I, a, did I it come read. about you gradually? I think it was gradually. You know, it was like just putting a lot of small weights on, on, on a scale and gradually it tipped mm -hmm. to the side where, hey, you know, that's enough. A good friend of mine, Drew Dyer, an excellent coach at Soderton. He's been out two years, has a lot of things to do business-wise. Uh, it's taken up golf, but uh, he's just returned to the game as an offensive coordinator for Wissahick and High. Mm -hmm. So you know, I don't discount that, but I can't see myself coming back as a head coach because a head coach is a lot more to it than just pure coaching. You know, you have to deal with uh, the media, you have to deal with administration, you have to deal with parents. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. If you want to be head coach, it goes with the territory. Mm -hmm. But it's not the pure coaching that you can get just being an assistant. 
or you show up with some preparation, you have your kids in your group and you work with them. And, uh, you know, it, it's a joy because, you know, that's the main reason you're there is just work with the kids. Are there some responsibilities, Mike Jr., that you'd rather not have to deal with? Uh, you know, pretty much as a head coach, um, you know, there are some things. Sometimes you have situations with parents. Uh, but as I said before, you, you know, you're going to take the good with the bad. Uh, unfortunately, as a head coach, there are a lot of situations that keep you away from the field um, and, and keep you busy, you know, doing paperwork and, and dealing with, you know, schedules and, and, and your athletic director and your athletic secretary. Keep you away from practice, you mean? Well, just or just be, w working on pure football. Um, but that's that's part of the, you know, it. falls under the umbrella of the responsibilities that of the head coach and, and um, you know, there are times, you know, dealing with the media and, and parents and things like that, that, uh, that keep you away from your preparation. But, uh, but as I said, you know, that's, that's just something you, ha you, know, you have to deal with as a head coach. It sounds like uh, the media may have represented a, a fair distraction for both of you, especially, especially when you competed. And Mike Sr., did you make any effort to not watch TV or not read the paper and just focus on your game? Well, I don't want to seem like I'm negative with the media. You know, it goes with the territory. Mm -hmm. uh, hey, you know, our kids, our program have got a lot of recognition, uh, positive and recently, you know, negative. You got to take the good with the bad. Mm -hmm. uh, I've always said when, when people have criticized, well, the football team gets too much credit. I said, hey, we've never asked for it. I said, if you... If you develop a long-standing tradition of excellence and winning, you're going to get that coverage. You, you don't seek it; it will seek you out. Mm -hmm. And you have to learn how to handle it because uh, it, it's going to be there. And when you look at uh, the attraction of high school sports, say hey, a lot of kids come out because of the excitement, and that excitement is generated by the crowds and, and you know the, the media and how they write up the games and how they cover the games. Uh, gets the crowd enthused and people interested. Mm -hmm. So it's something that, that is good. But uh, as I say, sometimes it does. If it's overwhelming, you know, like in a big uh, father-son contest, you're trying to prepare for a game and you have to do a couple interviews or you know have 20 uh, messages on your answering machine. Uh, but you know, it's something I think that the reason high school football and other sports have become so popular is the added coverage. When you ask me as a coach, how have you seen things change? I mean, the fact that, uh, you know, your, your network is going to do a statewide game. Uh, you know, the playoff games are covered on TV. Uh, you know, in our area, you know, three, six, and 10, they cover the high school games, uh, wrap ups Friday night, Saturday, channel 69 out of Allentown, the super mm -hmm. job, you know, the Pittsburgh stations, Tremendous coverage for high school sports, and that's something that's uh, that's evolved slowly. And I think I think it's a good thing. Let's talk about the uh, press conference at which you announced your retirement, and you were about to face this throng of, of reporters and uh, camera people. That's when you realized that it was it was really happening. What kind of emotions were you feeling at that time? I think I was I was pretty uh, at ease with that. The, the real problem I had was the meeting with my players before I went into the crowded auditorium and, and you know with all the cameras and the, the microphone. Well, how'd that go with the players then? Uh, I kind of had a prepared thing, uh, but as I tried to read my notes, uh, not that I was just reading a you know a statement, but uh, I, I kind of got very emotional. And uh, it was difficult for me. It was difficult for the players. I think there was a lot of communication without things being said. Uh, you know, they, they could see that I was really going to miss them, and it was a very hard decision. And I could see from their part that, you know, they cared about me and, uh, you know, felt the process that, that I was going through. Did they already know at this point that you were retiring? Yeah, they, they pretty much knew the word was out. Uh, but, you know, when you go in there and you make it official. They hadn't heard it from you yet. That's, that's correct. And that was right before the press conference. So that I was kind of relieved. I got through that and then went into the press conference. That, that was easy after that. Did you get lots of questions from the press? Were they curious about your future? Yeah, you know, questions. What are you going to do with all this free time? And, you know, that's, <laughs> uh, you know, a lot of questions, family questions, 
you know, things about the, you know, most memorable games, mm -hmm. biggest frustrations, you know, why did you make the decision to retire at this time? You know, uh, did, did you plan it this way, you know, going out on top and, uh, now, had we lost the last game, you know, I would have had people telling me, well, if you lose the game, you have to stay in it. You know, that's not the reason, you know, you are always uh, perfect seasons are hard to come by and, and, and you're fortunate to experience them. So uh, either way, perfect season, had we lost the last game, you know, that, that was it. I wasn't about to come back to end up on a winning note if it didn't work out in that state title game, because I don't think that's a reason to be in coaching for your personal record or that you as a coach end up with a win. You know, you got to enjoy it. You ask the kids to be 100% committed. And when you get to that time, as I said, I was wavering a little bit. If I could give you the commitment that I was accustomed to, what it takes to winning, uh, and I wasn't willing to give it, well, then you can't ask of the kids. So that was another factor, and it's time to step down. Now that uh, kids do have uh, other activity, myriad activities right. and other distractions to, uh, to choose from, how do you define uh, to a kid what a good commitment is? Is there any way to tell them in, in, in certain concrete terms what you expect? Well, as a coach, when you get a youngster to consider coming out with a team, uh, when we have uh, junior high orientation, you know, you get potential uh, football kids and you tell them, look, this is what I expect. Uh, you've heard a lot, uh, but this is the way it is. Summer camp, the time commitment, the off season, the weight room commitment. Uh, the sacrifices you're going to have to make. You can't be a regular student in the sense that if uh, somebody wants to socialize during study hall, you got to budget your time. You're going to have to be in the li library doing your work. Uh, on the weekends when there are parties and kids are going out, you you're going to have to be working on that project. Maybe you didn't have time to do during the week or, you know, observe the, the training rules and observe all the other things we ask of the players, uh, you know, to live up to the, the standard that we, we want. So, uh, these are the things you, you convey so they go into it with their eyes open. You know, I don't want to entice them uh, a sugar-coated uh, situation and then uh, have them go into shock. And they already hear a lot of stories about how demanding we are. But fortunately, you know, once you have the tradition and we've had success, the kids that wonder about, hey, is it too tough? They see so many other kids have gone in through the program, have been successful athletically, and have also done a great job in the classroom. And, you know, we're very proud of our kids that go to every level of uh, higher education. And, you know, we, we have the last couple of years some kids in the Ivy League at, uh, you know, Princeton. We've had kids go to Brown. And, you know, I'm always glad to hear the athletic director say that uh, in all the sports, the kids do best academically when they're in season. Because mm -hmm. I think they stay more focused. They know they have to budget their time. And also, uh, you know, you hang over their head uh, if you really want to continue playing, you know, you have to do excellent in the classroom because we have the strict, uh, you know, eligibility requirements academically. Did you ever have to approach a student and give him a lecture on the fact that his, his grades were slipping and there was trouble? Oh, absolutely. You know, when you talk to a junior about uh, some of his discipline problems, the ones I, I dealt with frequently were referrals that a youngster wasn't behaving himself in classroom as, as we want or in study hall or uh, not so much a, a behavior situation like that, that the academically wasn't turning in the work. First hmm. thing I ask the teacher, are they in over their head? Uh, but when I find out that they're maybe getting late for class, not turning in assignments, now you're not working to the best of your ability. Now I'm gonna come down hard on you. So yeah, eligibility is very important. You know, We have our excellent students and we, we have the kids that have to be prodded along. Uh, and I always tell them, hey, you love football, and as a 10th grader, my message has to be, and I'm sure any coach, the toughest thing on me or any coach in three years, if you give us three good, good years of football, and now because of your talent, you, you have the opportunity to be looked at by the college coaches. But when they come in and they look at your transcript, they just turn around and walk out. You know, that's one of the lowest points that your coach could have. You know, obviously, you're going to be disappointed. So. My job as a coach is not only to get them to perform on the field, but if they have that talent in a couple of years, that they prepare themselves. So we pound that into them. We pound it uh, into their parents, uh, the preparation, taking the proper academic courses. Do they always listen? No. You know, and I, I have the, sometimes kids have to go to prep school or mm. are marginal and can't get into the, the school of their choice. But, you know, you do the best they can. And, and you know, you got to remember 
kids make, uh, you know, free choices. But you, the coach is there to give uh, guidance and the advantage of some experience and wisdom, and you hope that most of the kids get the message. Mike Jr., what do you have to say about that subject? How do you get the message to your players? Well, as early as possible, because uh, what a lot of kids fail to realize is uh, really the senior year academically factors in very little um, w with the college uh, evaluation process. Usually those coaches are, are, are coming in after their junior years to find out. So what, what a lot of kids don't realize, it's, it's actually their ninth, 10th, and 11th grade years that are, that are critical. And they think that, you know, that they can slide by and all of a sudden turn it on their senior year and make it. Uh, so it's hard when we go down and talk to the, to the junior high kids, um, we make it very clear at that point that if you have any idea or any inkling that you want to be, uh, you know, a, a collegiate athlete, uh, you need to do well in the classroom now. Um, and I think the, you know, the gym teachers and the coaches at the, at the middle school level have done a good job of that. Um, we don't have that many kids that are, um, you know, just failing miserably coming up through the program. I mean, we, you know, if, if we, have, we think they have a chance to be a, a college player, and sometimes it's hard to know at that early a, a level, um, but we see a pretty good dedication in the classroom from most of our kids. I mean, obviously every program is going to have their, you know, a handful of kids that, are, that might be in classes in over their heads or, or for whatever reason aren't doing well. But, um, you know, I've been very pleased since I've been at North Penn uh, that, that the structure that the guidance department has, and it being such a large school, sometimes you think kids might get lost in the shuffle. Uh, but a lot of times, um, you know, I go to get involved with the situation and the guidance counselor and the teacher already have a very good handle on it. Have teachers come to you as they did your dad about specific cases where they'd like you to apply a little pressure on a particular student because of lackluster performance in the classroom? Certainly. Uh, you know, you're dealing with kids and a lot of times they're, they're motivated by different things. And, and in a perfect world, they're motivated by their desire to do well in the classroom. But uh, a lot of times that doesn't happen. They think that uh, they're, they're motivated entirely by uh, their, their extracurricular activity. In this case, it's football. So sometimes I, I've had a teacher come to me and, and, and tell me, hey, um, you know, listen, this kid thinks the world of the football program and he's so into it, but he's, he's sliding by here. Uh, you know, can you talk to him? You know, I, and uh, you know, a lot of times that the teachers do a good job here. They, they kind of go through their regular channel and, and, and uh, use uh, myself and the other coaches kind of as a last resort. And, and we've had to, to intervene in, in, uh, in some cases, but, but most of the times the, the kids have been responsive on their own. Mike Sr., let's get back to the circumstances of your retirement now. We're taping this interview in August of 2000. You announced your retirement, I think it was January of this year? January. So you've had plenty of months to adjust. How's it been going so far? Well, I really didn't feel kind of retired until after the Big 33 game because uh, I was in the same kind of cycle uh, preparation for football. You know, Big 33 is one game, but it was like uh, preparing for a season to play one game. Uh, got together a playbook, had coaches meetings, uh, was thinking about personnel. Uh, but now that that's over and that's only been a couple of short weeks, mm -hmm. uh, I'm now trying to get caught up on everything I put on the back burner for many, many years and uh, for the duration of the last six months. You know, my wife felt when I retired, she would get some of her honey do list things done. And I said, well, I got the big 33 game and that excuse is over with. So. Uh, the pressure's on, you know, see me in about a year and I'll tell you how retirement is when, when I get through some of these jobs. So when you announced your retirement, how'd your wife take that news? Yeah, we had talked and she knew it was, uh, you know, the best thing. And when I was wavering a little bit, uh, you know, she reminded me of some of the things I brought up uh, as far as my motivation to make the decision to retire. But, uh, you know, she was supportive. If I decided to hang in there, uh, she would have been okay with that. But she just wanted me to make sure that it was right for me because, you know, if it wasn't, I was going to not be very happy. And sometimes I'm pretty miserable anyway. So she, she wanted to be the right decision for me and, and be happy. So then since the Big 33 game, your mind's been off football for only a few weeks as of, as of right now, right? Basically, that's it. So, and the, the big test will be, uh, you know, when August camp starts, and I'm not a part of what I've been doing for so many years. Uh, Friday night, Saturday football, uh, you know, the excitement. Uh, I don't have that uh, 
as I say, adrenaline rush where you're preparing, getting ready for the big game and the excitement of being part of it. I'll be watching as a spectator. And I don't know how I'll respond. That's going to be a very big test. I was kidding some people. I said, well, now I'm going to be able to sit in the stands and call the perfect game. Is it your plan anyway to sit in the stands in person, at least do that much, if not call the perfect game? Well, I'm trying to uh, worm my way into the press box where I can get away from maybe the crowd and the comments because, uh, you know, it's going to be tough for me if I'm up there and I hear criticism of uh, the West players and the West coaches. And You mean from uh, the folks surrounding from you in the, the stands? From the folks around. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I, I maybe will be uh, the spotter for our announcer. That will get me off the hook. I know watching some of his You might need a little bit games. of isolation. So then. I've had a tough time watching some of his games where, you know, I'm saying to myself, uh, that's not what I would call. And, you know, you, you got to get your offense going. And uh, and then I hear some of the fans, uh, you know, being uh, pretty tough and critical. And I'm thinking, hey, it's okay for me to criticize my kid, but but not you. So <laughs> I'll have a tough adjustment. Uh, maybe I'll just stand in the end zone and watch the games uh, away from the crowd. Has it occurred to you, Mike Jr., now that your dad is retired, he's going to have a lot more opportunities to help you out? Sure. And uh, we, we kind of have a, a, a running bet with our staff. Uh, we're, we're wondering how many days it's going to take before he shows up at uh, one of our practices. So, uh, you know, the, the door is open. Uh, and a lot of people naturally ask me, you know, is, is he going to get involved with your program now? Is he going to come help out, help out at North Penn? And uh, you know, I joke with some people. I tell them that, you know, too many chiefs ruin the tribe. And, and if he comes over, I, you know, I'd make him uh, work with the kickers or something like that. But, uh, you know, all kidding aside, I mean, I, I'd be foolish not to, to use him as a resource. And, and he doesn't know this yet. But, uh, you know, I'm certainly going to be giving him uh, copies of our tapes and, and our opponent tape and, and asking for his advice when, when he's not, uh, you know, when he's in between breaks doing jobs for my mom. So hopefully I'll I'll be able to give him, uh, you know, a reason to get to get away from from some things and help me out. Well, I think we would have put it on record. He's not going to get any help when he plays CP West. Plus, I heard one of the staff members said, "If if your old man shows up, I'm out of here." So, <laughs> <laughs> it'll be interesting to see what happens. Okay, gentlemen, thank you. That's Mike Petton Sr. seated on the uh, left, and on the right is his son, Mike Petton Jr. They're both uh, very popular, winning coaches here in Pennsylvania. Gentlemen, uh, thank you for your time. Thank Pleasure. you. Thank you, Larry.